the, the between welterweight and at least in MMA, between welterweight and, and um, lightweight, it's 15 pounds. 155 to 170. Who walks around right at 170 or right at 155? Right. I mean, I walk around when I'm in shape. I'm at like 163. So where do I fight? Do I have to fight guys that are seven pounds heavier than me, or do I have to fight eight pounds dehydrated? Because I don't just walk around at 155 or 170. So I think they have to create a ton of weight classes if they're going to do that. And I still think people are going to dial it in. Oh, you're still going to be five pounds over, and you're going to go, oh, I can make an extra five pounds. Yeah, well, people always do You know, wrestling, you know, they've got all the weight classes, but people are still cutting down. It's, I mean, this, this is what I've suggested, and I, don't, and I think they might move this way. What I've suggested is that they, every year you have to do your license. When you do your license, you should have to show up within five pounds of the weight class you want to fight. If you want to fight at 135, you show up at 140, you do your physical, you do your neurological, you do your MRI, you do all your stuff at 140. If the doctor deems that you're hy hydrated enough and that you're functional enough and, you're, and, you're, and you're, your EKG or whatever, everything goes through well at your, close to your fighting weight, you're licensed for that year at your fighting weight. And then if you're not, if it's like, man, you're, you're really not performing well um, on your physical here, I'm going to license you for 145. And then that year you fight at 145, next year when you license again, you have the opportunity to make whatever weight you want to do. I think that's the way they, they should do it. And then you might still miss weight, you might have a bad weight cut, you might not, but at least hit the doctor checked you and did your physical while you were in the midst of a weight cut, and they can determine whether or not that's a, a, an acceptable weight for you to make when you get your license. And I think I hope that's where they go, that's what I've been pushing for the last couple of years. Thank you. I'm chewing my microphone. Yeah, it's basically close to the same thing. Would it be, would you say that learning how to cut productively close to the match is better than just look, getting down to that weight earlier on and training at that weight? Like, why not just make it your normal weight and well, train at that weight so that you don't have to worry about being close whenever it comes time? Well, I think, I think one is that people aren't that disciplined. Um, even professional athletes aren't that disciplined, and um, people gain more weight than they want to gain sometimes. They fight and they go and they eat and they blow up 10 pounds extra. So I think, one, it's really hard for people to stay at a weight, and it's easy for them to, you know, oh, I've got eight weeks, I've got 12 weeks, I can diet and I can exercise and get down to a certain, to a certain weight. I mean, we have a very, in my school, we have a very very structured plan as to what weight you're at each Monday um, and how you're cutting and what you're eating and what you're doing. So it's, um, if, if you do that, it's very simple. You just have to be disciplined to do it. Not everyone's disciplined to do it. Um, and then hopefully within two weeks, you're at a weight that is, that is that maintained. I, I actually, I'm for cutting weight, but I also think you should fight closer to your weight class. People are always trying to get one weight class down. And I find that one weight class up, they usually perform better. Um, and then it comes down, you know, because I feel when you don't have to, when your weight, when your fight camp is better because you're not spending 90% of your fight camp starving to death and and trying to worry about your food and getting on the treadmill and doing all these things to cut your weight when you can focus on training and just bring in bigger training partners, I think that works better. Um, so a lot of my guys are a tiny bit small for their weight class um, compared to others. And I think they fight better, they're faster, their cardio is much better because your cardio is really affected when you cut a lot of weight um, next day. It's really affected. So, and you know, you get muscle cramps and you get all sorts of, sort of things. So yeah, I would say fight closer to your weight, but I don't think we're ever going to get people not cutting weight. I think we're always going to have 10 to, 10 to 20 pounds is what you're going to walk around above your weight. And I just think even if we said, let's make it this, people would still find a way to try to get another weight class lower. It's just our nature. Hey there. I wrestled for four years in school and it gave me a lot of core strength and balance. And then I joined the Army and we started throwing in strikes and grappling and all sorts of stuff that you would never do in a high school wrestling match. So right. um, I felt like the transition was pretty good. But uh, the one thing I really struggled with was that um, just that muscle memory that I earned through school of, of not striking someone ever in any circumstance. I, I had a hard time. Uh, I had a lot of hesitation in the beginning. Right. And I even remember my drill sergeant said, it's not a wrestling match. Like, <laughs> so I just wanted to see if you had any input for someone like who was going to be a young athlete transitioning into maybe jujitsu. Um, from wrestling? Yeah, or? and just taking that hesitation away. Because that half second where you're hesitating on doing that strike is where you get hit in the face, basically. Yeah, I mean, I think the first thing you, you should do is, is um, 
goes strictly into like a boxing art, something where you have to get hit in the face and you have to hit back and you can't wrestle. I have a guy who's, a, I used to have a guy, he's a, he doesn't fight anymore, but he's a really good wrestler. And he's actually really good everywhere, but he would get, he was one of those guys that would get nervous. And then he, uh, he would freak out sometimes and just shoot from 20 feet away. And like one of them ended up being like the, the WEC highlight reel. Oh, no. Like they opened up with him getting, you know, guillotined off the ground because he shot from 20 feet away. And, and he just got nervous and just didn't punch and just shot. And it was like, oh, thank you. There's, thank you for the net. I'll take it. Um, but sometimes that's just a matter of just training and getting punched and, and getting used to it. Once you get that, then you can start making all your shots, make it necessary that you throw a hand before you shoot. So like we don't do anything, we don't shoot, we don't kick, we don't do anything without throwing at least a jab first, ever. Um, so all of our training goes like, you know, if I'm going to double A, I, I throw my left, I'm going to single leg, I throw my right because of where my head placement is going to be. So I don't, I don't do anything, um, I don't do any wrestling unless this hand is, is out and I'm getting, I'm getting them to react. But if you're not used to throwing and getting hit, you can't just start there. You have to just box for a while and get your ass handed to you boxing and get used to it and then start, I'm going to throw my jab, I'm going to double leg, I'm going to throw my cross, I'm going to single leg. And, and you'll find that you'll eventually get it, but yeah, it just takes, it's just never, like anything, it's repetition. You know, but and getting used to getting punched in the face, which was the biggest thing I had coming from karate um, to Muay Thai. I mean, I boxed when I was a little, when I was young, but then I did so much karate that when I went to Muay Thai, I had forgotten how to get punched in the face, and it was like trying to block it, and then ah, I'm running away while someone's just smashing me in the face. It's scary. You have to get used to that. You, there's no other way than just to get in there and do it. You know. Yeah, that's a quick way to learn. Yeah. Exactly. Thank you so much. For sure. Hello, my name is Alfred. I'm um, a four-year Navy veteran and practitioner, a five-year practitioner of Muay Thai. Nice. So, are you familiar with the um, with a Chinese MMA fighter who goes by the name of um, Shu Shagong? I do not think so. Um, you probably know. You might have heard about him. He was the he was the guy who basically like just completely pummeled that one Tai Chi master, and all of China got. Oh, okay. Are, are you, are yeah, not a. Yeah. And he, um, and also, um, uh, he, I don't know if you know this, but he also uh, came back round two, but this time he took on, um, I forgot what his name was, he's like, he was actually like the fourth generation grandson of, uh, of Imam himself. Okay. Um, took him on and uh, of course he completely, yeah, <laughs> completely just, just pummeled him into, into time pieces. Um, what, uh, what would be your... On, on that situation with him, like you know, just showing um, these uh, these masters and having to go into hiding from you know, yeah. What's what, what, what are your comments well, on? Well, that? I mean, the thing is that on some level that's been going around since you know you bring up yeah Gipman since those days. They used to do that all the time. They used to dojo storm and they would challenge with the Choi Le Foot guys. They would they would have rooftop fights and that's how Bruce Lee and and Wayne Chung got famous is from from fighting the other styles, the Hungar style, the Choi Foot styles of, of, of in Hong Kong. So I don't have a problem with that, honestly. I think, I mean, if that's what you want to do, I mean, I, I wouldn't personally go storming someone's, you know, it's, it's, it's like anything. It's like, again, I mean, I get up on stage, because I'm a comedian, I get up on stage and talk about people's beliefs that I think are silly, but I'm not going to go knock on door to door and tell you why, why atheism is correct. <laughs> um, and I don't feel like I'm going to go knock on your, on your school door and say, hey, I'm better than you, because I, I think that's really ridiculous. But if somebody wants to do that because they feel that they're maybe the other you know the other school is perpetuating some lie or, or again putting people in harm in you know harm's way by teaching people something that's not gonna work and you you know I, I can see somebody saying, Oh well I'm doing a service by teaching their, their students that this guy's a fraud. Um, I don't have a problem with friendly challenge matches though. Call that person up and say, let's let's do this. Let's see let's see who let's see which style's best. But I mean Again, at this point, I can't believe that we're, that's the whole thing. I can't believe we're still talking about this. I can't believe that there are still people that are, that need to do that. Like, yeah. I mean. Yeah, this is like a, yeah, this is like a big trend that's going on um, so far in, in China. I don't know, well, I don't know if it's like, a, if it's a still a trend right now, but basically like all these, all these uh, boxers, kickboxers, MMA fighters are basically chall are, are challenging or getting challenged by, um, by these so-called masters. And right. you'll see, you'll see videos all over YouTube that, it might, it might be a little hard to find because the, because the titles are actually in Chinese. But, right. Um, 
but yeah, I've been I've been clicking around, and yeah, a lot of these um, traditional kung fu, tai chi, whatever whatever you want to call it, they they're actually like getting their getting their, essentially getting their asses handed to you. And if you scan around um, in the comments, and they're pretty much they're the exact same. Oh, he's not a real master. Right. He wasn't going. Yeah, it's the no true Scotsman of martial arts for sure. Essentially. Yeah. So, with that said, um, do you think that maybe um, that traditional martial arts might have like just even a sliver of a chance to be able to bounce back up to becoming a fan? No, I, I I love traditional martial arts. Like I said, I love doing it for the art form, and I think like I still I'm enamored by. If you ever watch Jet Li? There's a, if you can find videos of Jet Li. Uh, Jet Li won like the, the Wushu World Championships, the Adult World Championships when he was like 13 years old. Dude's amazing. You watch Jet Li and I'm not enamored by that guy. Like I can do the craziest Wushu stuff that I've, I wish I could do, but um, yeah, I just, it's just not fighting. It's, it's martial arts, it's a dance, it's, uh, it's got some fighting aspects to it. I love, I've trained with, um, with Leono. Um, his karate's ridiculous, but he doesn't do karate, he does mixed martial arts. But I think there's always a room. If I, I mean, everyone now does it. You set something. You're, you do. You you're in a, a, a fight, and you can set up your spinning heel kick, or set up your flying knee, or your or or spinning back fist, or whatever it is you learn in your traditional martial art. That is a traditional martial art technique. Yeah, you, you use it. And to be honest, a lot of people don't train that stuff anymore. So you might catch them by surprise. And I find that happening a lot now. When people just do boxing, Muay Thai, and wrestling and jiu-jitsu, and they've never seen it. Uh, you know, an oblique kick to the knee or, or a kick to the knee. Or right. So all of a sudden you're, you're boxing, you're throwing your jab, you're faking shots, and boom, you, you knee kick them, and they go, what the hell was that? And you spin kick them in the head, and they go to sleep. And you're like, whoa, hey, I just did Kung Fu, right? So, <laughs> but I didn't just do Kung Fu, because if I had just done Kung Fu, I'd already been tapped out, you know what I'm saying? Cause, so, yeah, because mixed martial arts is just essentially you're, you're taking little bits and pieces of every right. single technique, you're just forming it into, into one arsenal. I mean, yeah. yeah. And it's usually, but, but yeah, that's also like another, um, another problem oh, with, with um, uh, the, that's also like another problem that I've been seeing with um, a lot of these MMA matches or a lot of MMA trainers is that it's usually, it's usually, they, they only use Muay Thai and, um, right. and Jiu Jitsu. Those are like, those, those are like the only, the only two, um, two styles that you see. I mean, right. Put into yeah, yeah. So I, I, we have like four minutes, three, three and a half minutes. I want to see if I can do it. Thank you, though. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. For sure. uh, I'll make this quick. About a, uh, injuries in uh, martial arts, these are the methods that they can kind of be beat up, heal, like the next day, be fine. Uh, but what about like real life, in your opinion? Uh, how long does it take for a fighter to actually heal to fight again? Like after just a, a regular, you're not, you're not talking about like a major injury, you're just talking about bangs and bang up bruises and stuff like that? Uh, give me a quick uh, quote. Well, I mean, I think I think most people, you know, unless you're too banged up, most people take a week off and they're back training. Um, you know, if you got black eyes and busted up nose, you might want to take take a few weeks off. Um, we have a lot of knee injuries and shoulder injuries in the ACL, um, meniscus tears. Um, a full a full ACL tear is like nine months. You know, it's surgery and you're in a boot and you're in rehab and it's it. You know, some people are are are. Uh, over time, um, a lot of neck injuries, a lot of people getting, um, you know, spine, and yeah, spine, a lot of spine injuries, and people getting surgery later on in life, and that can take forever to, to heal. But uh, I think most people just the normal stuff. It's like what if they got a week or two off and they're and they're right back in, you know. Um, so yeah, it's 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 different on on every occasion. But but the big ones are knees, 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 knees go out all the time, and um, and they take a long time. <laughs> Rise. Rise. Come on. I'm using my chief in that right now. Um, <laughs> well done. That's the first I've seen it work with. <laughs> hey, uh, so a question for you. You can see my height and everything. I got six, so I'm really fat now, but when I was healthy, I was 180. And they would put me in you know, that class, but most of the guys were way the hell down here. Right. How is, what is, what's your opinion on frame size, you know, frame differences as opposed to weight differences? Because my frame, Little guy coming at me, he's not going to get me in a stretch. He's not going to pull. Right. Well, um, I think every every body type has its advantages and disadvantages. Um, if you're tall and lanky, you've probably got you probably got some some decent natural power, and you from leverage. Well, and you, physics. And you, yeah, and you have and you you have reach. 
But um, you're also a lot easier to take down usually if you don't know how to use your base very well. If you know how to use your base, it's hard to take you down. But, uh, but, but you know, it, it all depends on how you use what you do. Yeah, well, but with my leverage, you know, if someone jumps in my back to try to choke me out, I can throw them without any problem at all. Right. Well, unless if they get their if they get their hooks in properly, then you're actually more in trouble because uh, because you have a lot more. No, but I, I actually control. accidentally hurt somebody when I'm back. You know, this was back in the early '90s when they didn't care so much about frame sizes right. as they do now. And I literally threw him just tuck and roll, and he went like ten feet and snapped his neck. Wow. So. <laughs> Yeah, yeah no, it's, it's, I think it has its advantages and disadvantages. I mean, that there, there are certainly people that are short, little, stocky, oh, high yeah, plug no, wrestlers I, I, that, that are just guy so saying, hard to deal with. I had a Korean guy. guy who was four foot eleven and kicked my ass. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think it's a matter of training. You, you have to, you have to know what you have to train, train your strengths, train your weaknesses, and uh, we have to. Yeah, personally, yeah, have no to problem. go. Thank you. But I, I can talk to you about outside. I know, well, so. put you in a headlock. Yeah, all right, so. Ooh, we'll, I want to see that. We'll talk to you, you, I'm filming, I'm filming. Do it, do it.